Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that Parliament approves the financial policy of the government for the financial year from 1st April 2018 to 31st March 2019. Before I start, let me first wish everyone a very happy Lunar New Year. This is going to be a long budget speech, as there are many important things to cover. Last year, I had one foul. It took me one and a half hours. This year, I have two fouls. <laughs> But I promise I'll call a recess in the middle. With that, let me begin. Riding on a global upturn, Singapore's economy picked up last year. Our GDP grew by 3.6%, up from 2.4% in 2016. This succeeded the government's focus of 1% to 3% at the start of 2017. Our productivity growth was 4.5%, as measured by real value added per actual hour worked, and 3.8% as measured by real value added per worker. These are the highest figures since 2010. The good productivity growth has enabled firms to pay higher wages while staying competitive. Real median income for Singapore citizens rose by 5.3% last year. For 2018, the Ministry of Trade and Industry expects growth to be more broad-based across sectors, but moderated from the high of 2017. <clears throat> the positive near-term outlook shows that the hard work of employers, workers and the government is paying off. With the support of businesses, trade associations and chambers and unions, we have launched 21 out of the proposed 23 industry transformation maps or ITMs. The remaining two will be launched by the end of March. The Tripartite Future Economy Council is now overseeing the implementation of these ITMs and the strategies laid out by the Committee on the Future Economy. Though new, the ITMs are helping to prepare our companies for a new phase of growth. For instance, as part of the Precision Engineering ITM, several companies in the sector, like Univac Precision Engineering, and Globotronic Precision have undertaken projects to make better use of digital technologies in their manufacturing processes. This has enabled them to stay competitive and take advantage of the global economic recovery. We recognize, however, that some sectors, such as construction and marine and offshore engineering, continue to face headwinds. While we address such near-term concerns, the budget must be a strategic and integrated plan to position Singapore for the future. Strategic because it should identify future needs and issues and propose early preparations to meet them. And integrated because it should pull together resources and integrate efforts across all stakeholders, workers, businesses, VWOs, governments, and our citizens to build a better Singapore for everyone. We must prepare for three major shifts in the coming decade. First, is a shift in global economic weight towards Asia. This will, be this will be accompanied by broader shifts in the global order. In recent years, several advanced economies have turned their attention inward in reaction to domestic pressures. For example, Brexit has put a cloud of uncertainty over the UK and its trade with the EU and the world. And the US's recent tax changes and review of trade pacts will intensify competition and economic nationalism, fueling anxieties worldwide. Meanwhile, Asia will play a larger role in global trade and investment flows. China has set up a regional infrastructure bank and laid out bold plans under the Belt and Road Initiative. India is reforming its economy, easing restrictions on foreign investments. Closer to home, ASEAN countries are moving up the value chain, and the middle class population is growing rapidly. All these developments represent significant opportunities for our firms and people. Our economy must be geared to write on and contribute to Asia's growth. However, there are also potential threats 
to the stability and growth of our region. Tensions on the Korean Peninsula and in the South China Sea can dampen investors' confidence. While the threat of terrorism across the region remains very real. The second shift is the emergence of new technologies. Robotics and digital technologies are changing the way we live, work, and play. They have already enabled the shift to Industry 4.0 and the rapid rise of e-commerce and the sharing economy. These are interacting with traditional businesses in different ways, sometimes as competing substitutes, sometimes as complementary enablers. New technologies are reshaping the economy and jobs. Firms will compete increasingly not on fiscal assets, but on intangible assets such as intellectual property, data, and user networks. First mover advantage and time to market will be key. Securing better jobs and higher wages will not be just about how well we did in school, but how well we continue to learn, relearn, adapt, and grow throughout our lives. The third shift is aging. We are well placed in Singapore to make the most of the collective wisdom of our seniors. But we must also be prepared for the challenges of an aging society. There will be a significant increase in healthcare and social expenditure, placing greater demands on families and the government. Also, our resident workforce will shrink, tightening our labour market and slowing economic growth further. Unless we remain dynamic in our outlook, are increasingly productive in the way we work and supplement our workforce with a calibrated inflow of workers from abroad. In addition to an aging population, there are other forces that can strain our social fabric. We need to keep a close watch on income inequality and social mobility. We want growth to uplift all Singaporeans and deepen our social compact. That is why we'll continue to invest in education and skills upgrading to give every Singaporean the best chance to realize his or her potential. We also promote sports, arts and heritage, and volunteerism and philanthropy to build common interests and shared activities. These three shifts will not operate in isolation, but interact together to affect us in profound ways. Some of these interactions will bring new opportunities. For instance, technology will help our older workers to stay productive and assist our caregivers to care for seniors. With many Asian consumers at the frontier of technology adoption, there are also many opportunities for companies to meet the demands of these tech-savvy consumers. But these shifts can also bring new challenges. The rapid pace of technological change may lead to older workers feeling marginalized. In some advanced economies, there is rising discontent over globalization and technological disruptions. And as technology becomes more pervasive, the risk of cyber attacks and online radicalization will also increase. Singapore is in a good position to guard against such challenges and capture the opportunities. Geographically, we are well connected to the world with flights to over 400 cities and shipping routes to over 600 ports globally. Within Asia, we have extensive connectivity to over 100 Asian cities by air and more than 250 Asian ports by sea. Digitally, we are connected to the world with over 500 terabits per second of potential capacity. And we'll continue to enhance our connectivity by investing in digital infrastructure, as well as land links, such as a KL Singapore high-speed rail. As an economy, we are open and free, with strong trade links and free trade agreements with many economies in the region and beyond. As a society, we are multiracial with an international outlook, enabling us to operate in a culturally diverse Asian and global environments. And our people, are also well-educated and tech-savvy. Budget 2018 will build on this strong position. First, 
will develop a more vibrant and innovative economy. We must anchor Singapore as a global Asia node of technology, innovation and enterprise. Welcome investments, talents and ideas to Singapore and be bold in venturing out into new markets. To do this, we must make innovation pervasive in our economy, develop deep capabilities in our firms and workers, and establish strong partnerships locally and abroad. <coughs> the shifts in the global economy and the emergence of new technologies are to our advantage because they allow us to seize opportunities beyond our borders. Second, we will build a smart, green and livable city. We should take full advantage of the latest technology to improve Singaporeans' quality of life. That is what our Smart Nation movement seeks to achieve. To improve our livability as a city, we must also enhance our urban sustainability and enable our economy to be more carbon efficient. Third, we'll continue to foster a caring and cohesive society. This requires our collective efforts. The government will continue to strengthen our social safety nets and supports, especially in the face of demographic challenges like ageing. We must also remain a society where all of us, as individuals, members of families and citizens, take pride in caring for ourselves, our children and seniors, and one another. Finally, we will continue to plan ahead for a fiscally sustainable and secure future. Preparing for the longer term shifts will require more resources to take care of our families, keep our people safe, invest in capabilities and develop new infrastructures. And we must do this amidst a period of greater geopolitical uncertainty and increasing tax competition. It is therefore our duty and responsibility to plan ahead and ensure that we have enough resources to do all that we need to do. Let me start with building a vibrant and innovative economy. We must support our firms and workers to overcome near-term challenges as well as prepare them to capture future opportunities. I will address each of this in turn. First, Overcoming near-term challenges. Though our economy picked up last year, our firms remain concerned about business costs. A key driver of this is wage costs, wage growth. But wage growth is good for Singaporeans. To sustain wage growth and keep business costs manageable, our firms must continue to improve productivity and achieve quality growth. We will support our firms to cope with near-term <coughs> cost pressures by extending two measures. First, I will extend the Wage Credit Scheme, or WCS. This scheme co-funds wage increases for Singaporean employees up to a gross monthly wage of $4,000. For 2017, we expect to pay out more than $800 million to more than 90,000 firms for wage increases given to more than 600,000 employees. I will extend the WCS for three more years. The WCS will provide 20% co-funding for 2018, 15% for 2019, and 10% for 2020. This will cost about $1.8 billion over the next three years. Second, I will enhance and extend the corporate income tax rebate. For year of assessment 2018, I will raise the CIT rebate to 40% of tax payable, capped at $15,000. I will also extend the CIT rebate to YA 2019 at the rate of 20% of tax payable, capped at $10,000. The enhancement extension will benefit all taxpaying companies, especially smaller ones. These changes are projected to cost an additional $475 million over the next two years. For the marine, shipyard and process sectors that still face weakness, I will defer the earlier announced increases in foreign workers' levy rates for another year. We will also strengthen support for our workers. 
We have been supporting those facing career transitions to stay employed and employable through the Adapt and Growth Initiative. For example, the professional conversion programs have helped more than 3,700 mid-career individuals take up new jobs last year. This year, we have strengthened employment support for lower to middle income workers in various ways. This includes upgrading the current work trial scheme into a career trial scheme with higher funding support for workers to try out new careers. The Minister for Manpower will elaborate on this and other measures at the Committee of Supply. Let me now move on to our longer-term transformation strategies. To capture future opportunities, our economy must transform in response to the three major shifts I mentioned earlier. The shift in global economy weights to Asia, the emergence of new technologies, and our demographic transition. And what changes do we have to make? New technologies mean that the ways in which companies do business, create value, and organize themselves will change, and change quickly. Our companies must keep up, and our workers must adapt as the nature of jobs and the skills required evolve. Asia's growth means new markets with new needs to be met. Changing global patterns of production and consumption together with new technologies will bring new opportunities, but also greater competition. Our businesses and workers must differentiate themselves and continue to venture abroad. And with an aging population, we need to find ways to reduce manpower demand while enabling our older workers to continue contributing. We have made a good start through the ITMs. In the next phase of our ITM journey, we will take a more cluster-based approach to reap synergies and strengthen linkages across multiple industries and explore new opportunities. And we must strengthen the three key enablers that lay the foundation for all the ITMs, innovation, capabilities, and partnership. First, we must foster pervasive innovation throughout our economy so that we can make the best use of technology, adapt quickly, and create new value to differentiate ourselves. Second, we must build deep capabilities in our firms and our people so that we can compete not on cost, but on the value and skills we bring. Third, we must forge strong partnerships, both locally and abroad, so that our firms and people can work together to address common challenges and access new opportunities in our region and beyond. By strengthening these three enablers, we can anchor Singapore as a global Asia node of technology, innovation, and enterprise. Let me start with the first enabler, innovation. With the rapid pace of change and greater competition, we must make innovation pervasive throughout our economy. Firms in every sector and of every size need to embrace innovation and to make the best use of new technologies as a competitive advantage. Take Penny United, a local concrete and cement company it has invested significantly in R&D, innovating new products to meet customer needs. For example, it has developed a new type of flexible concrete that can cushion the landing impact of aircraft, reducing wear and tear of airport runways. This concrete complies with the latest specifications set by the US Federal Aviation Administration. Pan United also has a range of concrete varieties catering to different specifications, including one that shields against proton radiation. Such product innovations have helped Pan United expand into regional and global markets. Pan United, you might say, is a concrete example of how innovation can help a firm cement its position as a market leader. This budget will support more firms to innovate across the entire value chain whether they buy new solutions, build their own, or partner others to co-innovate. 
Industry partners like the Singapore International Chamber of Commerce and the Big Four accounting firms have given us useful suggestions. We have studied and will implement some of them. First, we will support businesses to buy and use new solutions. We will streamline existing grants supporting the adoption of pre-scoped off-the-shelf technologies into a single productivity solutions grant. In addition, I will raise the tax deduction on licensing payments for the commercial use of intellectual property. With the expiry of the Productivity and Innovation Credit or PIC scheme, the tax deduction on licensing payments has reverted to 100% for YA 2019 and beyond. I will raise this to 200%, kept at $100,000 of licensing payments per year. This cap ensures that smaller businesses will benefit more from this measure. Next, to support businesses to build their own innovations, I will raise the tax deduction for IP registration fees from 100% to 200% to help firms protect their intangible assets. This will be capped at $100,000 of IP registration fees per year. I will also raise the tax deduction for qualifying expenses incurred on R&D done in Singapore from 150 to 250%. Finally, to help businesses find partners to co-create solutions, we will pilot an open innovation platform this year. This is a virtual crowdsourcing platform where companies can list specific challenges that can be addressed by digital solutions. They will then be matched with info communications and technology or ICT firms and research institutes to co-develop solutions. Besides supporting our firms to innovate, we will do more to harness our national research capabilities to enhance our economic competitiveness. We have built a strong research and knowledge base in our universities and A-star institutes, which provides a solid foundation for an innovative economy. To maintain this competitive edge, we have sustained our public sector R&D spending at 1% of GDP annually. We have various programs to translate our public sector research efforts into commercially viable applications, and we will build on this. This year, the National Research Foundation and Temasek will launch an NRF Temasek IP commercialization vehicle. This new investments venture will bring together Temasek's global investment networks and NRF's connections with the Singapore R&D community to grow companies that draw on IP <coughs> from publicly funded research. At least $100 million will go into this joint venture, $50 million from the government, and at least $50 million from Temasek. We will also continue to harness our R&D resources to drive greater adoption of digital technologies, automation, and robotics. To strengthen our status as an A and C hub, we will launch an aviation transformation program and a maritime transformation program this year. Through these programs, our airport and seaports will become platforms for companies to develop, test, and use new technologies. The solutions that emerge can be rapidly adopted in other parts of Singapore or even exported overseas. We'll provide support of up to $500 million for the two programs with additional matching investments expected from industry partners. To improve our labour productivity, we will also expand the National Robotics Programme and encourage wider use of robotics in the built environment sector, particularly in construction. Let me now move on to the second key enabler, building deep capabilities in our firms and workers. In particular, capabilities to internationalize, digitalize, and be more productive will be critical. For our firms, we'll provide more targeted support to help them build capabilities to meet their needs. Broad-based measures such as the PIC scheme have been useful in kickstarting a wider movement 
to improve productivity and to innovate. I'm heartened that many firms have embarked on this journey. We'll now build on this base and take a more targeted approach to help firms deepen the capabilities they need to continue growing. In April, we'll merge Spring and IE Singapore into Enterprise Singapore. Enterprise Singapore will provide integrated support to companies for internationalization as well as the development of other capabilities so as to help them compete better both locally and abroad. With the combined IE, IE's Global Company Partnerships Grants, we will combine IE's Global Company Partnership Grants with Spring's Capability Development Grant to form an integrated Enterprise Development Grant, or EDG. The EDG will provide up to 70% co-funding for companies to develop a range of capabilities. To further support firms to internationalize, I will enhance the double tax de deduction for internationalization, or DTDI. I will raise the amount of expenses that can qualify for the DTDI without prior approval from $100,000 to $150,000 per year of assessment. This will take effect from YA 2019. As we strengthen support for firms to build capabilities, I'll make adjustments to two broad-based tax schemes, the startup tax exemption and the partial tax exemption. These schemes help lower costs for smaller firms and startups, but do not directly help firms develop capabilities. In addition, every profitable company should pay some taxes. This is sound and equitable. So starting in YA 2020, I'll make two changes to the scheme. First, I will restrict the tax exemptions under both schemes to the first $200,000 of chargeable income. Second, for startups, I will exempt 75% instead of 100% currently of their first $100,000 of chargeable income from corporate tax. Even with these adjustments, corporate tax will remain low for startups and smaller firms. For a taxable income of $100,000, the effective corporate tax rate is 4.3% for startups and 8.1% for older firms, as compared to the headline rates of 17%. In addition, companies, including startups and smaller firms, can tap on a wide range of government support measures to build capabilities and grow their businesses. As digital technologies transform our economy, all firms must develop digital capabilities. Since we launched the SME Go Digital program last year to support companies to digitalize, more than 650 SMEs have benefited. This year, we are studying with the Singapore Business Federation and other industry partners the development of a nationwide e-invoicing framework this can help companies improve productivity and enhance cash flow. Besides our firms, we must train our people in digital skills. Industry partners, like the Association of Small and Medium Enterprises, have brought this up. Since we launched the Tech Skills Accelerator, or TESA, in 2016, over 27,000 training places have been taken up or committed. Elvin is one of those who took up the training Retrenched after 17 years as a systems engineer, he took up Tesla's program for cybersecurity, which equipped him with the skills needed to join ST Electronics as a white hat hacker, that is, someone who tests ICT systems for security loopholes. We will expand Tesla into new sectors like manufacturing and professional services, where digital technologies are increasingly important. Tesla will also support more people to learn emerging digital skills, such as in data analytics, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, and cybersecurity. We will set aside an additional $145 million for TESA over the next three years. The Minister for Communications and Information will speak more about this at the COS. Besides digital capabilities, we must also build deep skills 
for workers of all ages. There must be depth in whatever we do because this gives us the foundation to innovate and the ability to compete. This is the essence of skills future. Industry partners have a big role to play here. Ultimately, the capabilities of a firm depend on the capabilities of its people. I recently visited Infineon, a semiconductor manufacturer which takes training very seriously. Infineon plans its employee training and technology adoption in parallel, so that employees acquire relevant skills and new technologies are used effectively. I was pleased to, to meet Madam Isa. Madam Isa started out doing manual work in the assembly line 42 years ago. As Infineon upgraded its production processes, it also redesigned her job and trained her to use new machines. And when I spoke to Madam Isa, she told me cheerfully, I'm happy, I'm confident, I can do new things. Madam Isa's example shows that enterprise capabilities and human capital must be developed in tandem and be integrated with a company's overall growth strategy. We'll continue to work with industry partners to help the whole spectrum of our workforce develop deep skills. This will help our people to stay relevant and develop the cross-cultural skills needed to capture opportunities in the region and beyond. For the young, we have schemes like the Skills Future Earn and Learn program, a Work Learn program, as well as the Go Southeast Asia Award, which matches undergraduates and regional internships. For those with more work experience, we have schemes like the Skills Future Mid Career Enhanced Subsidy and the Professional Conversion programs. In particular, the PCP for Southeast Asia Ready Talents will equip Singaporeans with the know how to do well regionally. For our corporate leaders, it is important that they have the skills needed to drive transformation of their businesses and industries. To develop the next generation of corporate leaders, we have the Skills Future Leadership Development Initiative for LDI. Since it started last year, companies have committed to train almost 200 Singaporeans with over 180 more in the pipeline. This year, we will launch a new ASEAN Leadership Programme under the LDI to help our business leaders build networks and plan business expansions in Southeast Asian markets. I'm also happy to hear that SBF and, and SMU will pilot the SBF SMU Lead Charge Initiative this year to help SME leaders transform their organizations. Finally, as our workforce ages, firms must reconfigure how they operate to harness the experience of their older workers and allow them to continue to contribute meaningfully. <coughs> to support our older workers, we have raised a re-employment age to 67, extended the special employment credit and extended an enhanced work pro. With the close cooperation of the tripartite partners, Singapore's employment rates for residents aged 65 and above rose from 14.4% in 2007 to 25.8% in 2017. We'll continue to encourage age-friendly workplaces and review how we can better support our older workers. As we develop our people's capabilities, we may find skill sets in certain important fields are lacking. To plug these gaps quickly, we are piloting the Capability Transfer Program, or CTP, to support the transfer of skills from foreign specialists to Singaporean trainers and trainees. The Minister for Manpower will elaborate at the COS. Mr. Speaker, sir, I've spoken about how our efforts to make innovation pervasive and to build deep capabilities. The third key enabler is to forge strong partnerships. Competition is not the only driving force in our economy. Cooperation is also key. Where synergies exist, we can achieve more when we work together and draw on one another's strengths to address common challenges and capture bigger and better opportunities. For example, Ascender Singbridge, along with IE Singapore, brought together a group of Singaporean 
SMEs specialising in Industry 4.0 technology solutions to set up the Singapore Manufacturing Innovation Centre in Guangzhou, China. The centre provides these SMEs with a platform to co-create advanced manufacturing solutions with prospective Chinese clients, allowing the SMEs to reach out to the large Chinese market. We'll continue to encourage our companies to form strong partnerships both locally and abroad. Industry partners like the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce and Industry, or SCCI, have made similar suggestions. We will integrate various partnership support measures into a single PACT scheme, PACT. Under PACT, companies can receive up to 70% co-funding for projects undertaken in partnership with others. For the three schemes that I mentioned earlier, PACT, the Productivity Solutions Grant and the Enterprise Development Grant, I will set aside $800 million over the next three years. We we'll also strengthen our partnerships with overseas counterparts and anchor Singapore as a Global Asia node of technology, innovation and enterprise. This way, our firms and people can remain plugged into the latest developments all over the world and create new ideas by interacting with people from diverse backgrounds. Industry partners like the Singapore Malay Chamber of Commerce and Industry have pointed out that as our region grows, there will be important needs to address in infrastructure, healthcare, and other areas. We need to develop a good understanding of these needs so that we can innovate meaningful solutions to contribute to our region's development. That is why we launched the Global Innovation Alliance, or GIA, last year for Singaporeans to gain experience and build networks overseas. We have made early progress. Our university has Universities have expanded overseas internship programs to eight new locations, including ASEAN countries. We also launched GIA Beijing and established Block 71 in Suzhou and Jakarta. Besides venturing abroad, we also bring global innovation to Singapore through in initiatives at the Singapore Week of Innovation and Technology, or SWITCH. As ASEAN Chairman this year, we hope to make a meaningful contribution by developing an ASEAN Innovation Network. We hope this will strengthen the linkages among the innovation ecosystems in the region and spark new collaborations and solutions. The Minister for Trade and Industry, Trade, will speak more about our ASEAN plans at the COS. In particular, as Asia's growth will raise infrastructure demand, we seek to forge stronger partnerships in infrastructure development and en enhance connectivity in the region. China's Belt and Road Initiative, Japan and India's Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, and the World Bank's Infrastructure and Urban Development Hub in Singapore are just some examples of efforts to promote infrastructure development in our region. To contribute to Asia's infrastructure agenda, we will set up an infrastructure office. This office will bring together local and international firms from across the value chain, including infrastructure developers, institutional investors, multilaterals, and legal accounting and financial service providers to develop finance and execute infrastructure projects. The office will enable infrastructure players to better tap on opportunities in the region while supporting Asia's infrastructure development and economic growth. The Minister for Trade and Industry, Industry and the Senior Minister of State for Law and Finance will give more details at the COS. Our trade associations and chambers, TACs, play an important leadership role in forging partnerships and driving industry-level advancements. Through close interactions with their members, TACs understand the industry's challenges and opportunities better than the government can. We have seen various examples of TAC leadership and partnerships, which have helped their members uplift capabilities and overcome resource constraints. For instance, the SCCI, with support from JTC and Spring, 
has set up a trade association hub, or TA hub, at the Jurong Town Hall, with more than 30 TACs sharing facilities and resources. The TA hub, along with trade association committee, the SCCI also set up, will encourage TACs to collaborate with and support one another. In logistics, four TACs, along with Spring and the Centre of Innovation for Supply Chain Management at Republic Polytechnic, have come together to form the Logistics Alliance. Last year, it launched the Transport Integrated Platform, or TRIP, which integrates several existing systems into a single digital platform to enable easier tracking of container trucks and reduce idling time. The government will continue to support such efforts through the Local Enterprise and Association Development, or LEAD, program. In the last two years, about $45 million has been committed through LEAD for some 50 projects. So I look forward to even more TACs and businesses coming on board. Mr. Speaker, sir, ultimately, all our firms and workers face the same major shifts in a global environment, which will bring greater competition and a faster pace of change. The specific challenges and opportunities will differ from industry to industry, which is why we have taken a sectoral approach for the ITMs. But the key enablers in every industry and ITM are the same. Innovation, capabilities, and partnerships. By fostering pervasive innovations throughout our economy, building deep capabilities in our firms and people, and forging strong partnerships locally and abroad, we can succeed in our economic transformation. We can create and sustain a more vibrant and innovative economy. Mr. Speaker, sir, a strong economy is not an end in itself. It is a means to build a better home and provide a better quality of life for all our people. We will therefore continue to improve our living environment and make Singapore a smart, green and livable city. Our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, once said, a blighted urban jungle of concrete destroys the human spirit. Indeed, our urban planners recognised early on that with limited land, we had to build our city with foresight so we could provide a high-quality living environment even in a dense urban landscape. We designed our HDB estates with common spaces, parks and playgrounds so that everyone has easy access to amenities and public spaces. We planted thousands of trees and toyed to transform Singapore into a garden city and now a city in a garden. We may be highly urbanised, but we are not a concrete jungle. More than 40% of our island remains covered in greenery. We also enacted laws against pollution and cleaned up the Singapore River. Along the way, we became innovators in water treatment and waste management. Today, Singaporeans enjoy the comforts of a modern city along with clean air, clean water, and verdant spaces. Our reputation as a clean and green city is a source of pride for Singaporeans and attracts tourists and investments to our shores. Even otters have returned to our waterways. We must continue to improve our city and our environment and make Singapore an even better home to live, work, and play in. History has shown that the most enduring cities are those that are adaptable, flexible, and innovative. I spoke earlier about the emergence of new technologies as a major shift. Our Smart Nation movement aims to make the best use of these new technologies to improve our city, uplift our quality of life, enhance our economic competitiveness, and promote social cohesion. This transformation will require national efforts by the government together with the private and people sectors. The government is embarking on several strategic national projects 
to lay the foundation for smart nations. We are building a smart nation sensor platform to deploy sensors and Internet of Things devices to enhance municipal service delivery. We are developing a national digital identity system to enable citizens to authenticate their identities securely and easily when making online transactions. We are also increasing the adoption of e-payments island-wide to allow everyone to make simple, swift and seamless payments. At the same time, we are opening up digital platforms for the private sector to build innovative services and will share more data with the public to facilitate co-creation. The Minister in charge of the Smart Nation Initiative will elaborate more at the COS. Besides building a smart nation, we are also collaborating with academics and corporates in research and innovation to take Singapore's sustainable development story to the next level. One of the strategic domains in our Research, Innovation and Enterprise, or RIE 2020 plan, is urban solutions and sustainability. Last year, we launched the Cities of Tomorrow R&D program to drive innovations in urban development, such as ways to improve the sustainability, maintainability and reliability of buildings, raise construction productivity and create new spaces that we can live in. We also started the Closing the Waste Loop project to use technology to minimise the environmental impacts of the waste we generate. This year, we'll embark on Energy Grid 2.0 to develop next-generation grid architectures that can respond quickly and reliably to changes in energy demand and supply. For these three programmes, we'll set aside $250 million. To improve our living environment, we must also address one of the most pressing challenges the world faces, climate change. Climate change is more than just record-breaking temperatures, dry weather, or more intense rain. As a low-lying island, Singapore is particularly vulnerable to rising sea levels. That is why the government has in invested significantly to improve our infrastructure including protecting our coast and critical assets, building a water resilient water supply, or building a weather resilient water supply, and redesigning our flood management system. We must play our part to address the underlying cause of climate change, to make Singapore a more livable and sustainable city, and as a responsible member of the international community. Over the years, we have made various efforts to manage our greenhouse gas emissions. The Energy Conservation Act was enhanced last year to improve the energy efficiency of our industries. We are investing in public transport to make Singapore car light, and green certified buildings have become a hallmark in our urban landscape. Our early measures to be a green city have shown results. Singapore produces less carbon emissions per dollar of GDP than most countries. We intend to further reduce our emissions intensity to make a bigger effort to combat climate change. To encourage companies to further reduce emissions, I announced last year that we intend to implement a carbon tax from 2019. I will proceed with a carbon tax on all facilities producing 25,000 tonnes or more of greenhouse gas emissions in a year. It will be levied on the total emissions of each of these facilities. The first payments will be in 2020 based on emissions in 2019. The carbon tax will be $5 per tonne of greenhouse gas emissions in the first instance from 2019 to 2023. We'll review the carbon tax rates by 2023. We intend to increase it to a rate between $10 and $15 per tonne of emissions by 2030. In doing so, we will take into account international climate change developments, the progress of our emissions mitigation efforts, and our economic competitiveness. The carbon tax will apply uniformly to all sectors, without exemption. This is an economically efficient way 
to maintain a transparent, fair and consistent carbon price across the economy to incentivize emissions reduction. This means our initial carbon tax rate of $5 cannot be compared, directly compared with that in other countries. Jurisdictions with higher headline carbon prices often also have significant exemptions for particular sectors, which lowers their effective carbon price. The carbon tax will be levied on major emitters, which accounts for about 80% of Singapore's emissions. The remaining 20% is contributed by many other sources of varying sizes. We'll study how to account for these emissions and take action where necessary. For petrol, diesel, and compressed natural gas, we have excise duties, which already encourage reduction of the use of these fuels and therefore reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Hence, I will not levy an additional carbon tax on petrol, diesel, and CNG. I will also not increase the excise duties at this point in time, but will continue to review and adjust them periodically. The carbon tax will encourage businesses to take measures to reduce carbon emissions. Companies that do so will be more competitive as more countries impose tighter limits on their carbon emissions and international agreements on climate change like the Paris Agreement take effect. There will also be new opportunities in areas like sustainable energy and clean technology. We have to start preparing early so the industries have more time to adapt. To give companies and households a strong push in the first five years when we introduce carbon tax, we'll provide more grants and support to help them enhance energy efficiency and reduce emissions. We expect to collect carbon tax revenue of nearly $1 billion in the first five years. To achieve our goal of reducing emissions intensity as soon as possible, I'm prepared to spend more than this in the initial five years to support worthwhile projects which deliver the necessary abatements in emissions. I urge companies to do their part for a higher quality living environments for all by putting in meritorious proposals for emissions abatements and energy efficiency. Our agencies will evaluate this rigorously. I will set aside funds starting from 2019 to enhance support for companies, including SMEs and power generation companies, to improve energy efficiency. The support for companies will be done through schemes like the Productivity Grants for Energy Efficiency and the Energy Efficiency Fund. More support will go to projects that achieve greater emissions abatement beyond the basic abatement, beyond the basic enhancements. The Ministry of Trade and Industry, MTI, and the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources, MEWR, will share more details at a later date. For our households, the impact of the carbon tax will be small, at about 1% of total electricity and gas expenses on average. Still, to help households adjust, I will provide additional use safe for three years. Eligible HDB households will each receive $20 more per year from 2019 to 2021. The increase in USAFE will cover the expected average increase in electricity and gas expenses for HDB households arising from the carbon tax. MEWR will also work with the community to help households save energy and will announce more details at a later date. We have designated 2018 as the year of climate action to encourage all Singaporeans to fight climate change. The Minister for the Environment and Water Resources will speak more on our plans to reduce energy use and carbon emissions at the COS. Ultimately, measures like the carbon tax, along with our R&D programs and smart nation investments, are to make Singapore a more livable and sustainable city. In this effort, everyone has a role to play. I'm heartened to see various community efforts in this area. For instance, the Community in Bloom movement has brought together 
36,000 garden enthusiasts to cultivate more than 1,300 gardens all over Singapore, building, beautifying our landscape and fostering community spirit. And a kayak waterway cleanup program run by the non-profit Waterways Watch Society brings volunteers together to remove debris from our rivers and reservoirs while raising environmental awareness. In ways big and small, we can all contribute to building a smarter, greener and more livable city for all Singaporeans to enjoy. Mr. Speaker, sir, we have, with your permission, I will continue later with the measures we will implement to foster a caring and cohesive society and ensure a fiscally sustainable and secure future for Singapore. <laughs>